Hello, Shiver Seekers. Are you ready to follow us into the shocking unknown? I'm Cynthia. And I am Stephanie. And you have found the Dark Oak. Today, I'm going to tell you a shocking case, and I'm. it actually came to us from one of our listeners, Kristen, and I'm so glad that she sent this to us. She's been a big supporter of our podcast. I actually just want to shout out. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> we love you. Oh, as a matter of fact, she told me that she's a, a teacher, and she told me that for Halloween in her classroom, she played our Deadly Bugs episode for her students. Are you kidding me? Isn't that so fun? That is amazing. Yeah. yeah, she's an awesome teacher. And I just thought that was so brilliant and such a great idea. That is so cool. Yeah. So she was telling us how, you know, she used her, well, telling me how she used her, um, used the dark oak episodes and things that she was doing and she told me about this case and asked if I had ever heard about it and it happened in St. Augustine which is not too far from us where we live. One of my favorite cities we like to go there on our anniversary. So funny you're one of several people that have told me that that they like to go for their anniversary. It's like it's kind of our go-to if we don't want to like travel far it's just kind of our go-to anniversary place because there's just so many beautiful things it's romantic it's just got everything no it's true i mean it's got the waterfront it's got the historic bed and breakfasts yeah there's a lot of little treasures over there beautiful restaurants and we love it exactly well this murder case happened in saint augustine and learning about so it's a case about athalia is the woman that we're gonna cover Learning about her was so fascinating, but then also learning about more of the culture of St. Augustine was interesting. Uh, I unearthed a few things. I hope it doesn't change your opinion of St. Augustine. All I know is that it is reportedly very haunted. I've gone on quite a few ghost tours there. Well, based on the case I'm telling you, Athalia should be one of those haunts. Oh, I hope she is. (laughs) Maybe. I don't know. (laughs) I, I... Truly, I hope she's resting in peace. But if I was her, I would not be very peaceful. Oh, I'm intrigued. Yeah. Now, the case of Athalia. So Athalia Ponza Lindsley is her full name. And the crime against her was shocking. But the aftermath of the crime is truly disturbing. Oh, gosh. Okay. Right. And before I get into those details, we did talk a little bit about St. Augustine. But I want to tell our listeners a little bit more. Okay. Anyone who's grown up in Florida, St. Augustine was already on the list of field trips. Absolutely. I mean, anybody who's lived in Florida, grown up in Florida, you have been to St. Augustine. Not necessarily like honeymoon and, uh, you know, anniversary situations, but you've been there. You know about it. I've been there with you. Third grade. Oh, my gosh. How do you remember this stuff sometimes? I mean, I don't know. (laughs) A steel trap, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. (laughs) Once it goes in and never comes out. Yeah. So geographically, it's located on the northeast side of Florida on the Atlantic coast. And it is known as being the 1513 landing site of the Spanish explorer. Who? Ponce de Leon. Ponce de Leon. (laughs) Now, upon the landing, he is said to have called the area La Florida because it appeared to him to be the land of flowers. Oh, and it really is. It really is. It is beautiful. I do love living here. It is also said that a large part of his explorations were to find the mythological fountain of youth. I drank from it. Yeah, guys, letting you know, there is a pretend fountain of youth just because of this legend that we'll get into. And you can dip into it and drink some disgusting sulfurous water. And supposedly it's supposed to keep you young. Based on the fact that we drank it in third grade and have still continued to age, though, I'm really 
I'm not quite sold on its beneficial properties. Can I tell you, though, just to be on the safe side, because I'm a little like superstitious like that. Anytime we go visit the Fountain of Youth, I will drink from it just to be on the safe side. (laughs) Don't want to let that opportunity pass you by. huh? (laughs) Still waiting for it to work. But, you know, we're young at heart. Maybe that's maybe that's how it works. It works on the inside. Now, both of those stories about Ponce de Leon landing in St. Augustine and him looking for the Fountain of Youth are actually not really true. (laughs) It's more probable that Ponce de Leon landed a bit further south on the Florida coast. And there's no actually record of him referencing a Fountain of Youth. However, the city, as we've talked about, still holds tight to both of those legends. And there are many statues, paintings, names of restaurants, hotels, shops, giving tribute to Ponce de Leon and his fountain. Absolutely. It's everywhere. Everywhere. Even removing Ponce de Leon from the picture, however, St. Augustine is a really historic place. It is a well-preserved old town with historic buildings, cobblestone streets, and many historic monuments. It holds the title for America's oldest continuously occupied European settlement. That means it was established over 20 years before settlers established Roanoke and 42 years before Jamestown, and 55 years before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. That is crazy. Is It's crazy. Yeah. So as you can imagine, it holds a lot of historic historical significance, and the people of St. Augustine are really proud of their heritage. Now, over its first 300 years in existence, St. Augustine was a pretty bloody place to live. Its sovereign flag changed from Spain to England and back to Spain again, before the United States raised its flag in 1821. The next 100 years, however, would bring even more hardship. Conflicts between Native and non-Native Americans were on the rise, and the U.S. Civil War in particular took a deep toll on St. Augustine. While it eventually fell to Union troops, St. Augustine remained a town of Southern ideal. And frankly, this attitude and manner of operation in St. Augustine hasn't changed very much. It's still a staunchly Southern traditional town. The feel of St. Augustine, too, can take on a little bit of a feel of the haves and have nots. The 1900s aristocracy and old money really ruled the town. Yankees, Blacks, Native Americans, anyone who hadn't been born in the deep rooted Southern towns like St. Augustine, Atlanta, Memphis, Richmond, Savannah, you know, you're getting the idea. Mm -hmm. They were all kind of considered outsiders in the 1900s. A former resident once said, the caste system in St. Augustine was more rigid than India's. If you're not an insider, you're locked out. There is no new guard. The old guard reproduced. That's scary. This is kind of setting the tone for where we're going. The civil rights movement was particularly tense. Martin Luther King, along with several foot soldiers, were famously jailed overnight in St. Augustine as the town was turned over to white supremacists. At the height of the turmoil, the leader of the local integrationist, a dentist named Robert Haling, was viciously beaten and almost killed during a Klan meeting in 1963. Dr. Haling was subsequently hospitalized amazingly survived but upon discharge from the hospital he was charged with assault oh oh my gosh yeah so not the best history here even after the civil rights act was passed in 1964 the city was still not open to change the elite white male leaders began to close ranks in city clubs like the chamber of commerce the historical society the country club, the Rotary Club. You're getting the picture. Yes. Outsiders were just outsiders. Right. Now enters Athalia Ponsell. In the year 1971, Athalia seemed in some respects to be the perfect fit for St. Augustine. She was a beautiful, middle-aged, blonde, white woman of means. Born to a wealthy family in Toledo, Ohio, she was raised on the Isle of Pines, a U.S. island possession of Cuba and the Caribbean Sea. Her father was instrumental in bringing electricity to the island, and her mother, about a decade younger than her father, was a spirited and determined woman. And as I describe Athalia, you'll see she easily inherited this vivacious spirit from her mother. Shortly after finishing high school, Athalia and her sister, Geraldine, moved to New York. 
Originally having the last name of Fetter, Athalia and her sister changed their last name to Poncel as a sort of stage name. Oh. Isn't that fun? Uh, so fun. Yeah. Athalia spent 20 years in New York as a model, chorus line dancer, and hostess at Bud Collier's television game show, Winner Take All. Oh, I like her. Yeah, she was really making it. She even dated Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., the elder brother of President John F. Kennedy. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, that didn't work. There was a rumor they were engaged at one point. Unfortunately, Joseph passed away in the war, um, so it never came to fruition. But still, I would consider her pretty close to the end crowd. I would say so. Yeah. She's up there. Athalia was mentioned in multiple news stories, especially gossip columns, and became a bit of a really bottom tier celebrity. By the age of 30, though, her modeling career was slowing down and her mother was falling ill. Athalia decided to step out of the limelight and became a caretaker for her ailing mother. The two moved to Jacksonville, Florida, and lived in what was called the Riverside Mansion. Again, any house with a name, I'll take it. (laughs) Athalia met and married an insurance and real estate agent named Charles Bloom, but they divorced quietly some years later. Athalia tried her hand at real estate, but never really found passion in it. She then found her footing in politics, which does seem like a good fit, right? She took up membership seats in the League of American Pen Women, Daughters of the American Revolution, descendants of the knight of the garter which i had to look up because i'm like maybe i need to be in that (laughs) (laughs) magna carter dames and americans royal descent wow okay so she was busy she was busy and it almost reminds me of just like old world like socialites Mm -hmm. and debutantes yes yes she also wrote a book on gardening and registered patents for several household devices Oh, wow. But at some point, for reasons unknown, Athalia chose to move with her invalid mother to a large, white, Spanish-style mansion at 124 Marine Street on the Matanza River, arguably the most prominent street in all of St. Augustine. I can't wait to look up this house. While Athalia looked the part, she didn't fit the idea of a, quote, proper woman in St. Augustine. She was a newcomer, she was very outspoken, she was not easily pushed around, and for almost everyone, this became an immediate problem. (laughs) Despite her exclusion, or maybe because of her exclusion, Athalia began dating, and after only a few months, married James Lindsley, who was known as Jinx. Jinx was a widower that was not only an American... Jinx was a widower that was not only a St. Augustine native, but a former city mayor, a county commissioner, and a successful real estate agent, and by all accounts, a good old boy. So he was in, and her being with him gave her more of a chance of being in. Okay, I see this. I see this. It's possible the marriage was for love, but some reports say that Maybe it was a little bit more of out of convenience or opportunity. Athalia may have felt the need to marry into inclusion. And, you know, her association with Jinx may have helped her kind of assimilate. While some discussion circled around combining their two households, it appeared to bring about some obstacles. Firstly, two individuals aged 52 and 63 now had to combine half a lifetime of possessions. Right. They both have separate houses. She's living with her invalid mother. He was a widower. So I'm sure he has some of the things that they own together. And now they're trying to combine these into one household. That is a project. As someone who got married, you know, mid 30s, that is a project. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So in my opinion, that's not a huge thing, you know, that they didn't immediately move in together. Right. Um, she's still caretaking for her mother. Again, he has his own stuff that he probably shared with his late wife. So anyway, that's not a super red flag to me. Um, you know, and and I do feel like Athalia, you know, the second thing, again, with her ailing mother, I feel like she wanted her mother to kind of live out the rest of her days in the home where she was. Sure. Right. 
So the decision was made. They would live separately until sometime in the future where Athalia would be free to sell her home and move in with Jinx at the historic Lindsley House at 214 St. George Street. I, another house I can't wait to look up. <laughs> I love real estate, especially like old historic. Yeah. So while this decision was made, they were newlyweds, they were living separately. It seemed like a good idea at the time. And fortunately, this would prove to be the very wrong decision oh, for Athalia. No. Yeah. Athalia found her beloved home on Marine Street to be sandwiched between two high profile neighbors who came to despise her to the point of contempt. Oh, okay. According to records, it started with a complaint about barking coming from Athalia's six rescue dogs. So first of all, okay, six is a lot of dogs, but also they're rescue dogs. So, you know, I love that. Like You would have six rescue dogs. I would probably have six rescue dogs. Yes. And okay, I get it. Everybody's like, okay, you can't have your six dogs barking all over the place, but I want to give you more details. This notice of disturbing the peace was how she was introduced to her neighbors. They didn't come over and bring casseroles. They didn't come and introduce themselves. They just sent her a citation. They didn't even come over and say, hey, could you try to keep your dogs from barking all uh, day and all night? No, no. Her two no- neighbors, um, the wives, Rosemary McCormick and Patty Stanford, were just like, we don't like her. Automatically, we don't like her. And they also talk about really petty discussions about uh, Athalia had this uh, pink like bathrobe that she would go out and like bring the dogs in and out and they would like make fun of her robe and stuff. So they're just awful women. Not very. They're not women's women. They're not women's women. Okay. Absolutely. Now, interestingly, the barking did not seem to disturb anyone else in the neighborhood. And as a matter of fact, many referenced Marine Street as being a busy thoroughfare with a steady stream of traffic. I mean, on one in the street was a busy hospital, so there were loud sirens and things. And so this wasn't like a, it's a prominent street, but it wasn't like a super quiet, tucked away neighborhood where barking dogs would be a real issue. Okay. And obviously, we don't really know where the truth is here. I mean, Athelia can't speak for herself. But keep in mind, Athalia was a caretaker for her mother, who literally wasn't even use, able to use the bathroom on her own. So mm-hmm. Athalia was there all day long. Wouldn't you think that it's not like they left for work and the dogs were just out barking? So the fact that they're suggesting she just left the dogs out to bark all day seems unusual. But nevertheless, that was the complaint. According to the neighbors, Athalia did not correct the issue and they complained again and she was fined fifty dollars for the crime of disturbing the peace consequently she boarded all but three of her dogs but her neighbors were still not pleased with this and they continued to report the barking so something is not right here rosemary mccormick even went as far as to initiate a warrant for athalia's arrest on April 23rd, 1973, Patty Stanford took another route and decided to write a long letter to Judge Charles Mathis, which included the note, I feel like I'm in the middle of a nightmare. Oh, wouldn't it be great if the worst thing that ever happened to you was having to listen to some rescue dogs bark? Yeah, in the margin here, I wrote exaggeration much. <laughs> so... Maybe she did have barking dogs. Sure. Six dogs, rescue dogs. Maybe they came with some issues. Maybe they're barking. I do feel like this might have been blown out of proportion a little bit, though. Well, and the fact that she had three of them boarded makes me think, okay, she probably did have at least three dogs that were boarded, that were more barky. Yeah. And but one of she these... tried to fix it. Right. And and one of these dogs that she kept was actually her mother's dog named Zaza, mm-hmm. who was this like super ancient Pomeranian that I'm sure was not running around <laughs> the yard barking with like no teeth. <laughs> Even though, I don't know, you have a barky Pomeranian, so maybe I should say that. I have an ancient Pomeranian with no teeth and he, if barks. he would run around the yard barking. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, you know what? Maybe Athalia was in the wrong. <laughs> Maybe she was just out disturbing the peace. No, but I, I I, think from the story, it sounds like she really was trying to, like, fix the issue. Right. 
I mean, even with my barking dog, I my barking Pomeranian, my neighbors can't hear it from inside their house. Well, it's a Pomeranian. According to her neighbors, they definitely could. Now, I also want to note that Athalia's mother, Margarita, passed away the week of the escalated complaints, and there is no mention of her mother passing by either woman, and neither offered any condolences. That's awful. They just really went after her, even knowing her mother had just passed. Oh, my gosh. No, I I said it right the first time. They're horrible women. (laughs) Now... Fueled by what I can only imagine is a mix of grief, loss, anger, disbelief. Athalia was like, I'm done. I'm retaliating. So instead of par- what's peculiar, though, is instead of targeting Patty Stanford and R- Rosemary McCormick, who had generated the complaints and who Athalia would have had the most contact with, Athalia decided to go after their husbands specifically patty's husband alan stanford perhaps she thought he had more to lose because he was a prominent member of society so when you say go after you mean like try to get revenge upon not yes. like go after like the way a woman might go oh after no 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 okay. no no get revenge upon i mean get revenge upon okay. like you ruined my you ruined my life i'm gonna find a few ways to ruin yours Maybe were they the, I guess the women, the the husbands were like the breadwinners. Like, yep. so if you bring them down, you're bringing the whole house down. And I will tell you, I find Athalia to be incredibly clever. And I feel like she did that. She was like, you know what? You women are small potatoes. I'm going to find a way to, to like get you where it hurts. Ooh. Yeah. So, but at the same time, I'm like, they kind of asked for it. Well, they sound terrible. Yeah. So... I'll I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you what she did. You make up your own mind about okay. who, who was in the right and who was in the wrong. I'll remain open-minded. Yeah. In 1974, Alan Stanford, Patty's husband, was living the life of privileged white Southern male. He was born to Alan and Lydia Stanford Sr., a successful civil, civil engineer and a homemaker in a big house in the suburbs of Atlanta. So he was kind of, you know, this golden child. After high school, he attended a year at Clemson, which at the time was an all-white, all-male military college in South Carolina. When America entered World War II, Allen transferred to the United States Merchant Marine Academy in Kingsport, New York, where he joined the reserves and graduated with a degree in marine biology. He later obtained another degree in business administration, marketing, and finance from Emory University in Atlanta. So he's doing well for himself. In 1948, Alan met Patty, the wife that we know now. She was a beautiful brunette, willing to move with her husband wherever he chose. So she just wanted to be a homemaker. She wanted to be a wife. That was what she wanted to do. And the pair were the perfect young American couple. They were white. They were middle class. They were Southern. They were traditional. Alan found many jobs in sales over the next eight years, selling textiles, industrial parts, and commercial components in Atlanta, Texas, and Maryland. And finally, he settled in St. Augustine, where he sold aircraft parts. Within a short time, Alan caught wind of an open position for county manager for St. John's County. Alan was unanimously chosen to fill the position a feat which was more than likely aided by the fact that he had a very close commissioner friend. Mm -hmm. But there was one problem. The position required a civil engineer certificate, and Alan didn't have one. It was decided to let Alan start his duties to the commission with the understanding that he would receive a certificate as soon as possible, and he would be given a raise after it was completed. Okay. It wasn't hard for Athalia to find this Achilles heel. (laughs) Yeah, of course it wasn't. Yeah. One of Allen's first projects as county commissioner was to oversee the resurfacing of several roads. According to later questioning, the project was labeled as, quote, experimental. However, in January of 1973, the results left many roads crumbling with major potholes after only two months of being resurfaced. Wow. Okay. That's not a success. 
Uh, no. It was found that the road was resurfaced with only an, well, roads. Roads were resurfaced with only one inch of compacted asphalt, a stark contrast to the recommended six to eight usually used in typical road work. Okay. Shoddy. Yeah. As expected, the next county commission meeting was full of city and county members asking for someone to take responsibility. We've paid for this. Who on earth authorized this work? Athalia leapt at the chance to point the finger at Alan Stanford. She openly called Alan unqualified. She just stood up in the county meeting, said he was unqualified and pointed out his lack of a civil engineering certificate. <gasps> oh, no, she did. Oh, she totally did. <laughs> and it was a requirement. I mean, all of Alan's commissioner buddies, they knew he needed it, but they just were just going to brush it under the rug. Like, sure. you know, they didn't want it to be in the limelight. Athalia not only reminded the city of all their failings, but also alerted the media and the state of Florida. Okay. <laughs> I mean, one, you go, girl. Uh Uh-huh. Two, wow, she's a problem. She's a problem. She's a problem. Exactly. But in terms of, like, ingenuity and intellect, I mean, she was just running circles around them. I mean, she's not playing. I mean, I feel like we don't curse on our podcast, but I feel like this is, like, you know, F around and find out. Like I would say so. <laughs> this is an example. <laughs> like, whoo, you took the wrong woman for granted. Yeah, exactly. You mess with the wrong one. Yeah. Yeah. Don't mess with a woman with rescue dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So she's clearly just outmaneuvering Alan in every aspect, right? Yeah. By February, Allen absolutely had to see the walls kind of closing in on him. His fellow commissioners were beginning to tire of the continuous ruckus Athalia was making. She was reaching out to newspaper after newspaper and just running her mouth on the streets. And so they're kind of like, okay, Allen, we can't, we can't keep doing this. Because everything she's saying is valid. I mean. Absolutely everything she's saying is yeah. valid. Ooh. Yeah. And then... I mean, the shoes really started to drop. And Alan was informed that he was now under investigation by the Florida Board of Engineers for breaking the law because he was holding the seat without actually having an engineer's certificate. Now, that's interesting because I would think that he, I mean, he was elected with everyone knowing he didn't hold the certificate under the agreement that he was going to get you know the certificate right i think i think what they would have argued is he should have gotten and then reapplied like he should never have even been considered for the position until he had the qualifications correct so while athalia was really saying it was alan that was to blame it really was the whole commission that's what i'm saying it's it's not really his fault yeah, but he was the one that knowingly went into it. And he's the one that had not received the certificate yet. And again, she's the one that kept throwing his name around. But really, it was everyone's responsibility. Right. Yeah, to make sure he was fully qualified. It also started coming out. Athalia was telling anybody that would listen that Alan had threatened her life. And, you know, with everything being thrown out, you know, I think people were kind of like, is that really true? Is that not true? And However, one of these she actually brought up in a county commissioner meeting. She said, not only is Alan failing as a chair, but he has openly threatened my life. So this is actually on a record that she's saying he's threatening my life. Well, and you know what? I know that there are men out there who you start messing with them in the way that she's messing with him. They're going to threaten you. So... I, yeah. I mean, it's not unheard of. I guess we don't know for sure, but. Right. And and I mean, and for Alan's part, he literally had no reference points on how to manage or handle a woman like Athalia. I mean, his own mother and wife were very demure and acquiescent to him and any of his requests. And what may have been the final straw um, for him was when Athalia announced her own bid. For a county commissioner. I seat. knew it. I knew it. 
<laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I knew it. So let's fast forward to January 23rd of 1974. It was a perfect 72 degree Florida day. At 5.50 p.m., a neighbor at 101 Marine Street reported that he was sitting on his front porch when a man pulled up in a white Cadillac and instructed him to call 911. He said, quote, a woman has fallen out of a window. There's blood all over the place. Oh, no. Just a few minutes earlier, Patty Stanford had looked outside her window. You know, Patty Stanford, Allen's wife. wife. She suddenly handed her three-year-old daughter, Annette, to her teenage daughter, Patricia, and told Patricia to take the baby upstairs and play with her. By 610, Rosemary McCormick's son, Locke, had also called 911. And remember, that's the other neighbor, Mm -hmm. the one on the other side. Police arrived at the grisly scene on Marine Street. Athalia Ponzel Lindsley lay like a broken doll across the front steps of her luxurious home. Her heirloom pearls scattered around her body. Blood pooled around her feminine form and then cascaded down the steps. Blood spattered the beautiful white exterior wall of her home. Several of her fingers had been severed. Her right elbow had been mutilated from a cutting blow that split two and a half inches of bone and almost cut away her upper arm. The right wrist was almost in the same condition, with the right hand only dangling by tissue. And her head lay on the ground, attached to her body only by a single string of flesh. Okay, stop. This is a second story no this is the it did have the home had a second story Mm -hmm. but she was just on the front steps it was assumed by the passerby that she had fallen because of the scene okay however when they got closer they realized we're gonna learn that this was an attack i was gonna say that doesn't make sense no it doesn't this was not a fall from the window she was clearly attacked by someone no one was in the house When the police investigated, no one was in the house and nothing had been disturbed anywhere in her home. They found a brown paper bag of groceries upright on the kitchen floor. The back door, which led through the kitchen, was closed, but Athalia's keys still dangled from the lock. Like she had kind of come in in a hurry, set the groceries down, and it's theorized maybe she was running in to go to the restroom. Okay. You know, like, you know, when you're in a hurry, so she set the groceries down on the floor, left left the key, right. Further investigation of the exterior of the home revealed a blood trail that led from the body over the wall separating the Lindsley home from the Stanford home. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Officers then reported next door to the home of Locke McCormick to get his statement. Because remember, he had he was also one of the first ones to call 911. 18-year-old Locke was known to be an all-around good kid. He happened to be home from college to help with the local high school play. Locke told officers that around 610, so I'm saying a lot of times because they're really important here. So the first, um, you know, the first time anything was recorded was at 550. So they saw her on the front steps, right? And again, this is all a little bit of an estimate, but 550 was when the car pulled up and said something bad has happened. Locke is saying that At 6.10, his mother was in the kitchen, and he was sitting in the kitchen in the den of his house watching TV when he heard what he called loud snapping sounds, like hands clapping. Okay. He got up and looked out the window, which faced Athalia's home. He saw a white man wearing a white dress shirt and dark pants standing on Athalia's front step with his back to the McCormick's home. So he couldn't see his face. He just saw the back of this man. The man's hair was brown, gray, and closely trimmed. Locke yelled to his mother and ran outside about eight to ten feet from the doorstep where he saw the man's shoulders moving up and down as though he were swinging an object out of Locke's view. So Locke couldn't see what the object was but could see he was kind of like like a hammering type motion. The clapping sounds stopped. And then the man began slowly walking away from Athalia's home and angled off in a southwardly direction out of Locke's sight. Locke took a few steps forward, and that's when he saw Athalia's body, and he ran into the house and called for help. And that was at 6, 
10. 6, 10. 20 minutes after somebody allegedly saw her laying. Correct. Okay. Police interviewed several other neighbors, some of which were in absolute hysterics, but soon found that Locke was the only eyewitness to the murder. Okay. Later, Locke would reveal to the editors of the St. Augustine Record that the police left out a valuable piece of his eyewitness account. The words he yelled to his mother as he ran out the front door towards Athalia's murder were, quote, Mr. Stanford is killing Mrs. Ponzel. No, I just got chills. Yes. Just didn't put that in. So he couldn't see the person, but he was able to he, he, determine who it was. Yes. Okay. At that moment. Mm hmm. Things change and get a little weird as the story goes. But this is an important piece right here. Okay. At 7 p.m., Alan Stanford pulled up into the driveway of his home. When St. Augustine City Police told him his neighbor was dead, Alan asked, was she shot or was she cut? That's interesting. That's a weird response. Because he wasn't told she was murdered. He was told she was dead. Yeah, I think. Or it, we don't really know. But either way, I don't it's know. A weird but response. either way, it's a weird. Even if it was she was murdered, why would you say how was she murdered? Is that weird? I don't know. Okay, so if if someone said your neighbor is dead, I would say, oh my gosh, what happened? If someone said your neighbor's been murdered. I'd you probably say, say, oh, my gosh, what happened? Oh, my gosh, what happened? I wouldn't say. I think that's different than was she or, shot yeah. or was she cut? No, you're right. You're right. That's strange yeah. because there are all other manners right. uh, of, of thing that could have happened. But I would be curious as to how. And I think yes. that's fine. But I think that response specifically is very strange. Yes, I agree. Especially considering she was cut. Yes. Right. That's weird. Right. Now, again... I mentioned that her murder was specifically shocking, right? I mean, that scene I described it's is horrific, horrific, horrific. But what comes next will not only shock you, but should literally scare the pants off of you. Oh, no. An autopsy revealed that a long, sharp object had been the murder weapon, more than likely a machete. Oh, my gosh. I'm yeah. just thinking about Awful. how you said her head. Yes. Ugh. Now, that really sounds dramatic to our ears. And of course, I mean, death by machete is absolutely horrendous. But in 1970, St. Augustine, almost everyone owned a machete to deal with the dense Florida vines and scrub. Yes. So it was very common to have a machete at your sure. house to be able to deal with the palmettos and things like that. Right. So just going around looking for anybody with a machete wasn't really reasonable uh, because lots of people had them. There also weren't any reports of strange individuals in the area that caught any traction. You know, there was no, there weren't any vagrants or, you know, folks that look suspicious. Um, so naturally suspicion went first towards Jinx, her new husband, because, you know, that makes sense, right? Okay, I yeah. mean, most, most violence happens within families. After all, you know, and, and again, they had this particular marital arrangement where they weren't living together and they were like, is this really a romance? And while they had married really quickly, but remained living separately, it was clear that James Lindsay was like unmistakably in love with Athalia. Mm -hmm. He later said we were together almost every hour of the day, except at night when she went home to her house. And that really was true. Almost every day, Athalia would accompany James to his real estate office. And on January 23rd, the day of the murder, as they did at least once a week, they skipped work and made the hour drive to Jacksonville, Florida, to do some leisurely shopping. Okay. Athalia browsed through several department stores where she purchased a shirt for James, tried on some shoes, and picked up a repaired necklace from the jeweler. At 3.30 p.m., she and James did their grocery shopping and then headed home. Athalia picked up her car from James's real estate office and headed home around 530. She planned to head home, feed her dogs, give her, wait for it, her injured blue jay a little exercise in the yard. Okay, you guys are soul sisters. Oh my gosh. For I those love of it you so much. For those of you who don't know, Stephanie is like <laughs> any uh, special needs foul uh, uh <laughs> And by that, I literally mean like chicken, turkey, uh, Pigeon. pigeons. Yeah, our latest I ones are pigeons. I can't even keep, what else do you have? 
I don't even know. Or is There's that it? Ducks. Okay. There ducks. Yeah. Ducks. Yeah. Uh, that's it's my Stephanie's wheelhouse. wheelhouse. <laughs> so you guys are soul sisters. Yeah. So she headed home, feed the dog, feed her rescue dogs, mm. check on her injured blue jay that she was rehabbing. And then she was going to lock over and she was going to head back over to James's home because they had planned a special dinner because it was, get this, they were celebrating the Chinese New Year, which is the year of the tiger. Oh, she's adorable. Isn't this cute? Yes. Yeah. I really liked this. As for James's part in the evening, he ran several errands before pulling into his driveway between 6 and 6.30. Again, remember the timeline. Investigation into his story yielded an overwhelming number of eyewitnesses that corroborated his story, and it was quickly cleared of any involvement in the murder. With James completely clear, it became obvious that the next logical suspect was that of a man who had reportedly threatened Athalia's life. A man that, conveniently, had borrowed a machete from the county and never returned it. Oh. A man that had been called out by name by the only eyewitness to the murder. Yes. Yeah. That's kind of like, hey. Yeah. And also, a blood trail to his home. And a pretty strong motive. Pretty strong. Um, yeah, so Alan, let's do this. I'm looking at Alan. Let's do this, right? On the day of the murder at 4.15 p.m., Alan Stanford had two visitors from the Florida Department of Professional and Occupational Regulations. Yeah, the plot thickens, right? They were there at Athalia's request. <laughs> Her handwritten letter to the executive director read, Quote, we feel it our duty to inform of the apparent malpractice of a man who appears to be passing himself off as a certified engineer. He signs the county legal documents as the county engineer, when as far as we can ascertain, he has no engineering degree in any field. This seemingly chicanery cast a shadow on the Professional Engineering Society of the state of Florida comparable to a quack practicing medicine by bringing this to your attention we hope it can be investigated and rectified wow she was not pulling punches no not pulling punches the two officials stated they met for about an hour in which alan spent quite a bit of time airing grievances against athalia rather than addressing his lack of credentials It was also noted that Alan was very cool and calm during the interview. As a matter of fact, they thought he was too calm. The two men left Alan's office around 515 and took a drive down Marine Street. They planned to speak with Athalia the next morning and wanted to verify the location. They reported that Marine Street was quiet at 530 p.m. Investigators now needed to confirm Alan's whereabouts between the hours of 530 and 6 when the murder happened and six and seven when he arrived home at the crime scene. Right. So between five 30 and seven is really where all like the funny business happened. Sure. They decided to interview Alan's wife, Patty. Here is one of the excerpts from the interview of Patty Stanford on about the evening of January 23rd. Patty, we finished supper. I heard screams, an awful scream. The minute I heard it, I told Patricia to take the baby upstairs to watch television, and I went flying out the door. Investigator, which door did you go out? Patty, hesitates. It must have been the front door. Hesitates. Oh, I can't remember which door I went out. I was in a total state of confusion. Investigator, did you see anybody in the area at all? Patty, no, but then I would not have paid attention. The car traffic is what we live by all the time. See out front. Investigator, were you home most of the day? Patty, I was home all day until I took Patricia to her tennis game that was at, hesitates. It must have been around 4 p.m. Investigator, what time did you go back? Patty, I got back around 5.30. 
investigator. Did you notice anybody in the neighborhood who was strange in the neighborhood? Patty. No. See, we live in a funny neighborhood. Always people walking up and down Marine Street. It's not like a residential street that if you see somebody strange and say, there's a stranger, because those streets evidently go down to the hospital and back. Investigator. What time did your husband get home? Patty. He was here. I said, hurry, let's eat. And then we ate. And he said, I've got to go to the office and get a slide rule and a book. Investigator. What time did you get home from the tennis courts? Patty. It was either five or 5.15 or 5.30. Investigator. How long after you got home did your husband leave? Hesitation. Patty. I guess it was after we ate supper. So I wonder what I was doing. Investigator. Did you eat supper? Right? Patty. Yes. Investigator. You came home around 5.15. You fixed supper and your husband was there and he hung around until you got through working and you all sat down and ate supper. Right? Patty. Right. Investigator. Then he went to the office. Roughly what time would you say that was? Patty. Gosh, that's hard to say, because if I was cooking at 530, I'll tell you what creates my house so chaotic is because of the three and a half year old and the 18 year old is always tearing here and there. So times with me are yet, as I say, investigator. The time factor is very important. Patty. I can't give it to you exactly because we had been eating supper. He went out to the office. I don't remember what I did then. Investigator. Let's go through the sequence again. (laughs) As you can see, Patty is not, will not commit to any times, will not commit to any sequence. It's very strange. Yes, it is. Or, (laughs) devil's advocate. Go for it. She is completely overwhelmed. And the only reason why I can relate to that is because... I literally couldn't tell you what today's date is. And I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. And there are days, like, I would have to stop. In fact, several times today, I've had to stop and be like, what is today's day? Like, is it Monday (laughs) or Tuesday? And I think it's Tuesday. (laughs) Is it? (laughs) (laughs) But I think times are probably a little easier maybe than those types of things. But I just, I do know that sometimes... Uh, those kinds of things can get fuzzy even for me in this day and age with a cell phone that tells me the date and the time and the, you know, everything. So devil's advocate. Okay. Devil has it. And, and again, I think the investigator does. Mm -hmm. He said, let's try again. Yes. So he circles back around. She still will not give exact timeframes or say where her husband was, but this is what he was able to get out. Again, I've paraphrased kind of the back and forth. In broad terms, she said she left the house at 4 p.m. to take Patricia and Patricia's friend Hunter to the tennis courts. Then she went grocery shopping, picked the girls up, dropped off Hunter, and was home between 5.15 and 5.30. According to her account, she and Patricia brought in four large bags of groceries, which Patty unpacked herself and put away cooked dinner for the family. According to later testimony, it took her a whole three minutes to fry a steak. After which, she, Alan, and Patricia all sat down to dinner on or right before 6 p.m. Okay. So, she also strangely couldn't remember what Alan was wearing, but she was pretty sure it was his cruddy work clothes that he uses to work around the house. Definitely not his white shirt and dark pants that he wears to work every single day and everyone else at his office saw him wearing that day. Okay. So. And isn't that also what the assailant was wearing? Bingo. Okay. (laughs) Yes. So it's definitely not that. She knows that much. So. Okay. You see what I'm saying? I mean, 
I was being very gracious with her <laughs> when I was ex- only because I have had those moments at the same Absolutely. time. You should be able to deduce. Okay, well, if I drop them off at tennis at four, you can estimate then time. I know this and right. But you're going to bring in groceries, unpack them, cook dinner, and do that all in thirty minutes. Maybe there are women that can do that. I personally cannot. Uh, I would not be one of them. No way. Yeah. Okay. Now, directly contradicting her timeline was Patricia's friend Hunter, who was found to be very trustworthy and intelligent. She went on to win several awards in the county. And she claimed that she was not even picked up by Patty until 420. She called them last minute because her mother was out of town and she needed a ride to the tennis courts. She glanced at the clock when uh, Patty and Patricia stopped to pick her up. And she said she and Patricia didn't even begin to play tennis until 425 and that Patty didn't come back for at least an hour. Hunter asserts that she got home between 530 and 540 and her stepfather confirms her recollection. So Alan doesn't have an alibi for the time of the murder. You wouldn't think. Based on that, Patricia's recollection of events were no more convincing than her mother's. In her series of events, they returned home about 5.30. Her father came home and immediately changed into work clothes, even though she also couldn't remember what he was previously wearing. He played with the baby. He had a drink. He looked at the paper and left abruptly for the office at 5.45, which would mean all of those events I just listed, he did in 15 minutes. Superman, Superman speed. Yeah, stranger still were the actions of the neighbors post-murder. So everybody just went about their day. Children were allowed to play outside. Patricia even admitted to going outside to let Annette play in the yard the day after the murder. I cannot imagine doing that if there was a machete-wielding murderer on the loose. No. Who would literally you, hit the house next door to you? Would you do that? In daylight? Unless you knew who the murderer No. What? Isn't that bizarre? Yeah, no, that's... That's, that's weird, right? Okay. That right there... You would just allow your children to go outside and play in the yard, even though your neighbor was just killed with a machete the day before. No. Okay. That to me, no, that's not possible. Right. Like, that doesn't make any sense. On January 25th, two days after the murder, a search warrant was issued for Alan Stanford's home. The search appears to have been thorough, but the only real items that provided any clues were linked to the blood trail, which led to Alan's home. Which to me is a very clear, uh, I mean, you can't overlook that. Well, and even if it was not Alan, the murderer obviously went through yes. his yard. Yes. Yes. So, yes. That's, Absolutely. Uh, they didn't see that? Nobody saw that? A bloody no. murderer? Nope. Coming through the yard? Nope. Nobody saw a thing. Okay. No, they saw a thing. Uh, police found and collected two bricks in the garage that had drops of blood. Mm-mm. Police also found blood in Alan's car on the seat and steering wheel, as well as blood smear and drops on the sign and signpost outside of Alan's office. Okay, that's a lot of blood in a lot of areas. Uh-huh, where blood should not be. Right. Right. Unfortunately, there was no sign of a murder weapon or bloody clothing. Nothing to definitively tie Alan to the murder. I mean, except for all these other things. I mean, I guess they are circumstantial, but I don't know. Blood in his car. I mean, I don't know. Again, there's nobody saying, well, actually, no, I take that back. Locke did say he saw him doing it. (laughs) That right there, like, that right there is huge. However, Locke McCormick, it only took him two days to recant his eyewitness statement, sure, saying he wasn't sure who he saw. Alan first refused a polygraph test, but then said he had one administered privately. This is weird. Okay. <laughs> After weeks of calling, the administrator of the test said, so, I mean, the police are like, okay, fine, but we need to know what the results are. We want to talk to the person that gave you this test, right? So they called this guy for weeks. And couldn't get him to call back. Finally, he answered and said that, quote, Alan 
checked out, but also added, quote, if for any reason I am wrong, or if subsequent investigation reveals me wrong, then all I can say in the matter is, well, justice will prevail, and it will. It most certainly will. End quote. Okay. So that sounds definitive to First me. of all, I'm hiring somebody to give me a private polygraph. I mean, hello, that's suspicious. Weird. Uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, weird. Yeah. In mid-February, detectives got a break in the case. And a small creek connected to the San Sebastian River at the end of a road only a few streets over from Marine Street was a discovery. A rusted machete. Mm -hmm. And next to it was a bundle under a pile of mud containing a pink towel with a belt hanging out of it. Inside the rolled blood-stained towel, detectives found a Hamilton wristwatch stained with blood, a pair of dark blue pants with blood on one of the pant legs, a long sleeve white shirt saturated with blood stains, a white handkerchief, a baby diaper with blue paint on it, a black belt, and a purple tie. There was blonde hair on the machete and the pants. Later that day, two wingtip shoes were found. Over the next few days, each item found in the bundle was linked to Alan. Case closed. First, the watch, which has been repaired at the jeweler, was identified by its serial number. Okay. Case closed. No, Cynthia, this is crazy to me. I told you, you would be shocked, disturbed, (laughs) terrified. I cannot believe this case. A sales clerk clearly remembered selling the shirt and the pants to Patty. Even the blue paint found on the baby diaper was linked back to a Sherman Williams shop that sold the blue paint to the Stanfords. And the baby diaper, they have a baby. Yes. There was no doubt this waterlogged bundle belonged to Alan. Obviously. It was his stuff. The day Alan was arrested, support for him began to crescendo. Yeah, yeah. This is messed up. Instead of being asked to step down from his commissioner's job, he was merely put on indefinite unpaid leave. His church, Trinity Episcopal, rallied around him and would open sessions by praying for Allen. This act in particular infuriated John Lindsley, you know, Jinx, Mm -hmm. Athalia's husband, who in a letter accused the Episcopal diocese of, quote, thinking it more proper to pray for the wolf than the slaughtered lamb, which gives me chills. I mean, that's crazy. (sighs) He was right. I've seen this before in another case that I've read about uh, where, for whatever reason, the the murderer is just like this high profile person. And even though it's so obvious they did it, everybody just rallies around them. And the victims are almost treated like the bad guys. Well, you know, like the Murdoch murders yes. that are just all overrated because it, it was similar. Yes. These very high profile, wealthy individuals. Mm-hmm. And it's like everybody just turns a blind eye. Right. It's so disturbing to me. It's terrifying. And at the same time, and this doesn't make it okay by any means, but I can also see how if you're not a really good person, willing to do the right thing all the time how it's a sticky situation because you know a lot of people really find themselves in a rock between a rock and a hard place when you know these high power people they're requesting favors of you and to go against them is a big deal it's a big deal i mean you still got to do it because it's like i mean you got to do the right thing yeah (laughs) when you're talking about somebody's life but yeah Exactly. And what was missing from any news article, any commissioner meeting, any talk on the streets was any amount of sympathy or empathy for Athalia. Which is awful. Yeah. The opinion, I mean, this just sums this whole case up for me. The opinion was either Alan was innocent or if he did do it, Athalia had it come. Oh, no, that just, oh, I'm mad. Uh Uh-huh. 
Yeah. Had it coming. Had she was it practically coming. decapitated. Yeah. So the idea was, again, how do we start this by saying she's a problem? She's a problem. Yeah, right. So people are like, well, if he did it, I mean, at least he took care of our problem. Wow. Yeah. Disturbing. At the advice of a friend, Alan Stanford hired Walter Arnold as his attorney. Arnold was the lead attorney in a prominent law firm in the area. The Stanfords couldn't afford the fees, however, so Alan's father-in-law, Perry Mullen, fit the bill. Something that had been done regularly for the Stanfords over the years. So this was not unusual for his father-in-law to step in and kind of throw them a bone. And because Alan was on unpaid leave and Patty did not work, Trinity Episcopal started fiercely fundraising to provide financial support to the Stanfords throughout the trial. Seems a bit wild to me that a religious organization would sponsor as a charity a man accused of murder. That's hairy. Mm -hmm. That's hairy. You got to be really careful. Yeah. That's that's pretty hairy because, man, if you're wrong. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. As it turns out, uh, the attorney that Alan hired, uh, Walter Arnold, was worth every penny. He immediately got to work by having any evidence collected at Alan's home thrown out. How? He argued that the bloody bricks collected in the garage were not covered under the search warrant, which only specified the home. And they were in the garage. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Here's another thing that's scary. Like the little technicalities, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't just do everything by the book, which please do everything by the book. But if you don't do everything by the book. They felt like they were. Right. Yeah. This is a case where that's just somebody's being tricky. But that's scary that important stuff like that can be thrown out. Yeah. He won. So that's gone. Next, he squashed the prosecution's attempt to move the trial to a different venue. Incredibly, this is one of the few cases where the prosecution would argue for a change in venue. I was going to say that's strange. Yeah. Normally, it's the defense that's arguing that public opinion meant their client would receive a fair trial. Right. But Alan's a big guy in St. Augustine. Yeah. So Arnold won that, too. Mm. The trial would be in St. John's County, where all of his cronies are. Mm Mm-hmm. The trial of Alan Stanford began in January 1975, almost one year from the murder of Athalia Ponzel Lindsley. Unfortunately, the cards were already stacked against the prosecution. Jury selection was difficult at best, and by the trial came, many eyewitnesses refused to testify for the prosecution, including Locke McCormick, who adamantly denied knowing the identity of the person he saw the day of the murder. See, and I feel bad for him because he's a young kid living two doors down from this guy who he probably liked. He was probably friendly with. And he was friends with Patricia. Right. And that's her father. Right. And so he may not, he may literally be asking himself, did I really see that? I couldn't have seen that. Like, I can see where you would get in your head when you're talking about. I saw this person murdering yeah. somebody. Yeah. And again, how far are you willing to stick your neck out? Right. You know? The prosecution entered the evidence allowed, specifically the machete. And Walter Arnold did an incredible job of planting reasonable doubt into the minds of the jury. He claimed that it was impossible to know if the machete found was the same machete Alan had borrowed. Like, This machete found next to this bundle of stuff that was Alan's. That was bloody, right? Or there were... So they're saying, he said, yeah, it's possibly the murder weapon, but how do you know that was the one that Alan had? Could have been anybody's machete. Okay. But I'm saying, but it was found in the creek bed next to Alan's belongings. Okay. But he's saying, well, Alan's stuff could have been there, but who knows if that was his machete? How could you say that was his? Okay. So you couldn't directly put the machete in his hands, right? Sure. I mean, sure. (laughs) And he argued further that Alan often left his vehicle unlocked, and it would have been very easy for a passerby to take the machete from his car, kill Athalia without Alan even knowing. And he even brought up James Lindsley as a possible suspect again even though it's been very clear he has an alibi but he stated 
that their unusual marriage pointed towards the chances of a lover's quarrel. And he noted that James also owned a machete and could have used it. Um, Of course, he left out the parts where James' machete was accounted for and clean of any biological material the day of the murder. Well, that information wouldn't have been very helpful. Absolutely not. (laughs) While the blood on the machete and clothes were type A, which matched Athalia, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, the blood evidence was too degraded from the water to make an exact match. The same was true of the hair. It was consistent with her hair, but there was no way to say for sure. And somehow what appeared to be a slam dunk for the prosecution, which you and I have alluded to, started turning into what would appear to be only circumstantial evidence. It's crazy. If you didn't want to believe that Alan Stanford was guilty, Arnold opened the door. He let you be able to say, I don't want him to be guilty. If you didn't want to believe that your friend, city leader, prominent member of society was capable of committing murder, Arnold had given you your way out. Yeah. Reasonable doubt. Yeah. But you know what? That's kind of what our justice system is. I, I mean, know. it's kind of like a crazy example of how, man, yeah. I don't know. On January 31st, Alan Stanford took the stand in his defense. Oh, that's bizarre. Yeah. Alan said, wait till you hear what he said. He said, quote, I believe that if Mrs. Lindsley had been in a mental mental institution, this would show cause for her erratic actions. I thought hers was an unstable life and that the number of husbands might be useful. And his attorney said, would be useful how? He said, it would indicate an alien kind of attitude. And I understand she had five husbands. Side note, that was not correct. Alan described Athalia as, quote, less than pleasant and also recalled that many people who observed her actions in public considered her a, quote, nut. Okay, sure, maybe so. I just, so what? Right. And also, I don't know. I mean, is there any consideration for the fact that she's a murder victim? Right. Yeah. Like, I don't care who she, who cares if she is a nut? Who cares that she's been married 17 times? Right. Like somebody murdered her. So the fact that he's mudslinging. Right. In his defense against this woman who's been murdered, even if he wasn't the murderer. I just think that is so bizarre. Not classy. Not classy. Yeah, at the least. On February 4th, after a 13-day trial, Alan Stanford was acquitted wow. of Athalia Ponza Lindsley's murder. That's crazy. In a statement to the press, Alan said, quote, the evidence and testimony in the trial indicates some sort of plot, and I was the scapegoat. I've been confident all along. As a matter of fact, I prepared a statement of victory. I feel like victory used here is a strange, like, not like I've been found innocent, but I've prepared a statement of victory. Yeah, he won. He won. He came out on top. He He won. She lost. Isn't that a weird word usage? I mean, he won. He went on to thank his faith in God, confidence in himself. (laughs) Oh, no, stop. No, really. (laughs) And a good family for his acquittal. For lying about where I was. (laughs) And giving me an alibi. Yeah. But victory would not prove to be the repercussions of this case. For anyone, Athalia now lies in the St. Augustine Cemetery. And Alan, while acquitted, began to become a bit of a pariah in St. Augustine. And he and his family moved to Miami and then to a small town in South Carolina. He never again rose to political power. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. All evidence in this case has now been destroyed as this case was considered closed, not cold, and the storage room was needed. The prosecution and other investigators said that continue to investigate this case would be to prosecute an innocent person. Wow. Yeah. All that is left now is the memory of a victim who was a woman before her time. An intelligent, outspoken woman who didn't fit the mold 
and ultimately paid the price. It's possible the truth may come out one day. Many witnesses in this case are still alive. Maybe one day Athalia will get justice. Maybe one day we all will. Wow. I would like to hear Locke like on his deathbed. I'd like to go be like, hey, so. Yeah. How old would it be now? So that was that was in the almost 80s. So when he was 18 at the time. Yeah. He's still around. Yeah. Yeah. 60s. Yeah. Oh, man. That's so wild. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, I was telling you before I even started writing this. I mean, again, I'm so grateful that we got the recommendation. Mm, um, yeah. The book. There's a specific book um, called Murder in St. Augustine that covers all of this in pretty great detail. I highly recommend it. We'll link it in the show notes. Um, and again, love that our listeners are sending us like great material. This was really hard for me to write, though, because I... It's technically a unsolved murder, but it's not. Right. I mean, it's, you know, for the prosecution to say to continue to investigate would be to prosecute an innocent person because they know they know who did it. And again, that the case was considered closed, not cold. It's not cold. Well, and there, there is double jeopardy. So he can't be prosecuted, at least for the same charges. Right. That he was brought the first right, time. Unless something dramatically to have to pop up and him get new charges right um the whole destroying of evidence like i understand like space is not unlimited but like that always gets me because any potential case could change at any time like i think we should never how awful for any like for any situation where hey we want to go back and reinvestigate that reinvestigate this case for any reason right we can't because there's no evidence it's been destroyed but, I feel like they got like their one stab at him and they weren't successful and there's no going back now. And in this case, that's probably true. Yeah. But. Wow. He really. Uh, he really either lucked out. I don't know if luck is the right word. I don't know. But wow. He. He yeah. got lucky. Yeah. So the theory is that he came um, you know, he he came home directly after the meeting. And killed her. Because he's livid. Yes. Got in a car, drove to his office, cleaned up, threw the stuff in the river, and then drove back to his house at 7. What I would be really curious, and they may not be able to figure this out, because chances are he had more than one white button-down shirt and dark blue pants Mm -hmm. and tie. But I would be very curious, like, if they had done a search of his home. Like, we know he has a white shirt. He was seen in it earlier in the day. Can they find it in his home or is it missing? Because if it had been missing and then found in a bundle later. Yeah. Again, I, like more more proof that that was his belonging. Yeah. I, mean, I guess in this case it wouldn't have mattered. But, you know, I find really interesting, though. So think about the things that were found in the bundle. There was a shirt, there were pants, there was a belt, a tie, and remember there were shoes as well. Yes. So he may have had a change of clothes. Did he have extra shoes? What if he literally showed up at home shoeless that night? Right. Well, gosh, Stephanie, that was like a really great case. And you're right. I'm ne- <laughs> Next time I'm there celebrating my anniversary, I might have a different idea in the back of my head about St. Augustine. Yeah. And and maybe it has changed, you know, in the 50 years since this happened. Uh, But yeah, I always think it's, you know, the grass is always greener. You know, when I visit St. Augustine, I'm like, it's so charming. It's so beautiful. It's so much history. But everywhere has got its issues. So true. Yeah. So true. There are monsters all among us. Oh, absolutely. Um. One of them, I think, is named Alan Stanford. That's just me. <laughs> I'm with you there. <laughs> and on my next ghost uh, ghost tour, I'm going to be looking for. Go down Marine Street. I'm. Oh, you know go I will. House. You have the addresses. Go check them out. You know I will. Yeah. I've already. I was like, I can't wait to go see those. Fun. <laughs> Your husband will love that. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, I know we're here on our anniversary, but I got to make a stop. <laughs> <laughs> He's used to it by now. <laughs> 
<laughs> love, love, love. Guys, if you have interesting cases like this you want us to cover, please send them our way. We would love to hear about them. You can email us at the dark oak podcast at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Absolutely. Hey, and please feel free to share our episodes for your classroom. Isn't That's that awesome. amazing? This would be a great one for the, like Florida history. I feel like Kristen is a trendsetter. I love it. <laughs> Thanks again, Kristen. Awesome. Catch us next week. Yeah. More thrills and chills. Bye-bye. Bye. Hello, Shiver Seekers. Are you ready to follow us into the shocking? This episode of The Dark Oak was created, researched, written, recorded, hosted, edited, published, and marketed by Cynthia and Stephanie of Just Us Gals Productions and made possible by you, our Shiver Seeking listener. Special thanks goes to Justice Himes for our incredible artwork and Ryan Crete for our amazing music.